Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we have a, a special treat today, Dr. Jennifer Wyatch, who is one of the uh, a, one of the uh, real stars in a field that has evolved perhaps more rapidly than any in hematology in recent uh, memory, uh, that is the um, understanding of the pathogenesis, the prognosis, uh, and, uh, and uh, improving treatment for patients uh, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia will be speaking to us today. Dr. Wojcic comes from the Ohio State uh, University, the James Cancer Center, uh, which is really uh, has been a, um, a major innovator in the treatment and understanding of CLL, uh, working with her mentor, John Bird, and now in her own right, uh, she did her fellowship there uh, and subsequently joined the faculty, rising to the um, level of associate professor. Uh, where where she now serves as a section chief uh, uh, in a section uh, called chronic lymphocytic leukemia and hairy cell leukemia within the division of hematology and the director of human studies uh, of their experimental hematology uh, laboratory. She's also an extraordinary teacher, has won multiple excellence in teaching awards, uh, uh, both as a, a fellow and junior faculty, um, uh, and uh, multiple additional honors and awards, including uh, ASCO uh, Young Physician Scientist Award, American Society of Hematology Merit Award, and, um, and in a variety of internal awards uh, uh, at Ohio State. Uh, she's lectured uh, internationally um, with great regularity. I've uh, seen her talks at multiple educational sessions uh, at the American Society of Hematology, and most recently, and uh, or and recently, just two years ago, at the plenary session where she presented a landmark study uh, on uh, CLL and the um, which was has uh, changed the standard of care uh, for this illness. And she has really been coin of the realm in understanding uh, targeted therapies uh, and understanding mechanisms of resistance. Uh, as well as prognostic factors uh, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and particularly um, has been responsible for major advances in uh, the use of BTK inhibitors and other targeted therapies in leukemia alone or in combination. She's on the editorial board of Blood um, and has published over 103 peer-reviewed articles, primarily focused on uh, advances uh, in understanding and treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So we are really delighted. Uh, we had you here not long ago for our own uh, Sylvester Leukemia Symposium, but it's wonderful to have you back in Miami. Just wish we could have had you uh, in person. So we'll have to uh, make future reservations for that. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for such a nice introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Are you guys seeing um, the presentation screen right now? Okay. Um, so I'll be talking today about the evolving frontline therapy in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which as Dr. Rosenblatt said is a disease that has undergone major therapeutic advances and is continuing to do so um, with current clinical trials. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you put it on presentation mode, please? Yeah. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Um, so during the talk today, I'll discuss the current standards for frontline CLL therapy, and then we'll talk about some of the open questions in the field and how these may be answered by current and planned ongoing studies. So uh, just a short bit of background for those of you who don't see CLL patients in your clinic every day. Um, CLL is the most prevalent adult leukemia. There's about 15,000 new cases diagnosed per year. Um, it is actually not the most commonly diagnosed leukemia. That's actually acute myeloid leukemia. <clears throat> but due to the chronic nature of disease and the fact that many patients live for a very long time, it is by far the most prevalent. It is considered to be a disease primarily of older patients with a median age at diagnosis of 72 years, and about three quarters of patients are diagnosed after the age of 65. 
It has a slight male predominance, especially for younger patients. And it is more frequently seen in Caucasians um, than African Americans and very, very uncommonly seen in Asians. <laughs> it is responsible for about 4,500 deaths per year. And the absolute survival has increased significantly during the past two decades. Um, so five-year survival from like in the 1980s was about 54% compared to 60% in the early 2000s, and actually much higher than that right now, up to the 80% or so. And what I usually tell patients when they're first diagnosed with CLL and I'm seeing them in the clinic is not to look at anything on the internet related to survival because even the most updated survival data that we have doesn't take into account some of the new advances we have. And I think we're going to see over the next decade that survival really for most patients is going to approach their age matched um, controls without CLL. So we'll start by talking about some of the current standards for frontline CLL therapy and then how we choose among them. <clears throat> so we're going to start with um, the B cell receptor signaling pathway. <clears throat> this is just a schematic of the pathway. Um, in a normal B cell, an antigen is going to be detected by the B cell receptor and it's going to cause recruitment and activation of two proteins, LIN and SICK. Um, they then recruit BTK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase up to the plasma membrane where it's then activated. And that goes on to activate um, PLC gamma 2 directly. Um, and then through a number of downstream pathways after that, um, via inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol, um, it can lead to a number of actions. And in, in a normal B cell, depending on how mature the B cell is and depending on the antigen that is ligated, this can lead to proliferation, activation, or energy, or even apoptosis, especially if recognizing a self-antigen. In CLL, um, as well as many other of the B cell malignancies, um, there is not much contact between the CLL cell and the outside environment, so they, it doesn't get a lot of stimulation through the B cell receptor itself. However, many of the downstream parts of the pathway are significantly overexpressed and constitutively active. Um, in CLL, this includes BTK, which is an important therapeutic target because it is really a very non-redundant part of the system. So um, what happens in a CLL cell then, once you get all of this activation, is it um, doesn't ever lead to energy, doesn't ever lead to apoptosis. Basically, it's always leading to survival and proliferation through um, the AKT pathway, the MAP kinase pathway, and NF-kappa B. So right now we have two FDA-approved covalent or <clears throat> irreversible inhibitors of BTK that are in use in CLL. And those are ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. And by irreversibly inhibiting BTK, it basically shuts down all of the downstream signaling. Um, so it shuts down that proliferation, shuts down the activation, shuts down survival. <clears throat> the first in class of these agents, so where we have the most data, is a drug called ibrutinib. And the first trial that examined ibrutinib in a randomized fashion was called the Resonate 2 study. Um, this trial took previously untreated patients age 65 and older and randomized to either ibrutinib or chlorambucil. Um, even at the time of the study, chlorambucil really wasn't the primary standard of care for CLL patients, um, but some sort of chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus an antibody would have been. We see um, here that ibrutinib, which is in yellow, has significantly improved progression-free survival over chlorambucil. Um, that led to an 84% reduction in the risk of either progression or death with treatment uh, with the BTK inhibitor. Um, with long-term follow-up um, that was presented last year, at five years after the study started, 70% of the patients that were treated with ibrutinib remain progression-free um, compared to very, very few of those patients who were treated with chlorambucil. So I mentioned that at the time that study was started, um, chlorambucil itself really wasn't the standard of care. So what was? Um, and it was actually different for patients who were younger and patients who were older. And so kind of around the same time that that Resonate 2 study was starting, there were two cooperative group studies. And the cooperative groups are the um, groups of large cancer centers and 
lots of community practices too, that come together to complete large studies, which is especially relevant for um, rarer diseases like CLL is. Um, so we're going to go through two of those. The first one, which is called ECOG 1912, was a study designed for younger patients. So this included patients under the age of 70, so in CLL that's considered younger. Um, on this trial, these patients were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to ibrutinib, and in this case, ibrutinib was given with rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody commonly used in um, therapy of CLL and other hematologic malignancies. The second arm, which was the standard therapy arm, received combination chemotherapy, fludarabine plus cyclophosphamide, plus that same anti-CD20 antibody rituximab. So FCR is given for six cycles, so about six months, whereas the ibrutinib and rituximab, the rituximab was given for about six months. And then from that period on, patients received ibrutinib as a single agent that was given until disease progression. So these are the characteristics of all the patients that were enrolled on the study. So it's a very, very young study by CLL standards with a median age of 58. Um, most of the patients had a good performance status. Um, most of them had symptomatic or all of them should have had symptomatic disease. We use FISH testing to predict prognosis in CLL. Um, on this study, our most high risk marker, which is a deletion, a part of chromosome 17 called a 17P deletion. And those patients actually weren't included on this study, um, but there were patients, about 20% of so, had an 11Q deletion, which results in disruption of the ATM gene and is also considered a high-risk mutation in CLL. 18% um, of the patients had an extra copy of chromosome 12 called trisomy 12 as an intermediate prognostic marker. 34% had a deletion in chromosome 13 called a 13Q deletion, which is actually a good prognostic marker. 71% of patients were IGHV unmutated, and this um, is a prognostic marker that indicates a more primitive or premature precursor cell and is considered to be higher risk. So this is the progression-free and the overall survival in this study with about three years median follow-up. And we saw importantly that the combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab has superior progression-free survival to that standard of care, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. Um, at three years, progression-free survival was 89% in the ibrutinib rituximab arm compared to only 71% in the FCR arm. Perhaps more importantly, and actually much more surprisingly, there was actually an overall survival benefit to ibrutinib plus rituximab as well. Um, this is surprising because it, with such an um, indolent disease where there's a lot of options for second line therapy, it has traditionally been very difficult to show a survival advantage in CLO. And many times, even a drug that is very effective, we don't see a survival advantage until um, many years down the road. So this was a, a very, very promising um, outcome of the study. Here we can see the progression-free survival based upon the IGHV mutational status. So again, this is breaking down our CLL patient population into a high-risk group, and that's IGHV unmutated, and then a low-risk group, which is IGHV mutated. And from these curves, we can see that most of the benefit we see to ibrutinib rituximab in this situation is because of those IGHV unmutated patients. So when you're looking at those patients with very good wrist disease, um, there actually right now is not really any difference between the two treatment arms, mostly because everybody is doing well. So we can see that 80% of the people in both groups are still progression-free at even out to five years. So this is looking at the adverse events um, that were grade three or higher, so the significant adverse events between the two treatment arms. And we can see that pretty much down the line, if you're looking at hematologic side effects, so things like neutropenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia, those are all gonna be higher in patients receiving chemotherapy. Um, as well, any infections was higher in people receiving chemotherapy. There are a couple side effects that are um, related to ibrutinib. Um, many of these are cardiac event, 
effects like atrial fibrillation, which was seen um, grade three or higher in 3% of patients on the abrutinib arm and was not seen at all on the FCR arm. Again, this is a younger patient population. Um, as well, hypertension, which is coming out more and more to be associated with ibrutinib when patients are treated longer, um, was seen much more commonly in patients on the ibrutinib or tuximab arm. Bleeding is another side effect that has been associated with ibrutinib in the clinical trials, and it was actually very low in both groups, um, so not statistically significant. So that was um, the trial for the younger patients. Patients who were age 65 or older were represented in the AO41202 study. Um, so this took patients, again, 65 or older, and randomized them to actually one of three different arms. Um, the standard of care for this older patient population at the time was considered to be a chemotherapy drug called bendamustine in combination with that antibody rituximab. Um, so patients were assigned to that versus ibrutinib given as a single agent versus ibrutinib given in combination with rituximab. And this study did allow patients with 17P deletion um, to be enrolled. And there was um, about 6% overall um, pretty evenly distributed among the arms. Um, on this study, the median age was 71 with a range of 65 up to 89. Um, we saw that about 10% of patients had a mutation in the tumor suppressor protein TP53, which is another important prognostic factor in CLL. And 61% of the patients on the study were IGHV unmutated. These are the results from the um, Alliance study, and you can see clearly that the two ibrutinib-containing regimens had a longer progression-free survival compared with bendamustine plus rituximab. Um, at two years, 74% of patients treated with BR were progression-free, compared with 87% of patients treated with ibrutinib alone, and 88% of the patients treated with a combination of ibrutinib plus rituximab. We can also see here that there it was no difference at all between ibrutinib given by itself and ibrutinib given in combination with rituximab, and that's an important finding which um, leads to most patients right now, if they're being treated with ibrutinib as standard of care, um, most patients are treated with it as a single agent rather than the combination. When we looked at patients with 17P deletion, so again, this is um, this results in loss of the TP53 gene and is associated with very poor prognosis in CLL. At 24 months, no patient with 17P deletion who was treated with bendamustine rituximab was progression-free, um, but about 74% of patients on the other arms were. We also looked at something called complex karyotype, um, which in CLL is defined as three or more different cytogenetic abnormalities in the um, leukemic clone. And we know that in CLL, complex karyotype is considered a high-risk feature. Um, and as well, it has been shown that for patients treated with ibrutinib in the relapse setting, complex karyotype is actually one of the strongest indicators of a shorter progression-free survival. So um, we can see that there is still a difference between ibrutinib-based regimens and the chemotherapy, whether patients had a complex or non-complex karyotype. Um, we also see that patients treated with chemotherapy did much better if they were non-complex than complex. Um, but interestingly, we actually don't see any difference right now in outcomes for the patients treated with ibrutinib who are complex or not complex, although that's something that may come out with longer follow-up. <laughs> and similar to what I showed you in the ECOG study, when we look at pa the patients who are expected to have very good outcomes, so those with IGHB mutated disease, um, and in our study, we also used another surrogate of this called ZAP70 methylated disease. Um, we can see that there is not a statistically significant difference between chemotherapy and the ibrutinib containing arms, um, although the, the curves are starting to separate at the end of the curves there. So I think with longer follow-up, we may see some differences there. Overall survival on this study was not different among the arms. Um, I didn't mention this, um, but you may have seen in the schema that in this study there was a crossover, so it really wasn't designed to find any sort of difference in survival. Um, there also are some of those ibrutinib-associated toxicities that may lead to more side effects and potentially mortality in these, um, especially older patients, which I'll show you in just a second. <laughs> 
Um, so when we look at the grade three or higher or the significant adverse events on this study, we can see again that basically any hematologic toxicity is going to be more common when you treat with chemotherapy as opposed to this targeted therapy. Um, the non-hematologic side effects were slightly more common in the ibrutinib-containing arms, um, and this was primarily driven by those ibrutinib-associated side effects, including hypertension, which was much more common in the ibrutinib arms, and atrial fibrillation. Another thing that I think is important to point out is when we look at this study compared to the younger patients, we do see a much higher rate of significant atrial fibrillation and overall atrial fibrillation too. Um, in this study, between 6 and 9 percent of the patients on the ibrutinib-containing arms had se severe atrial fibrillation, and about 15 percent overall had developed atrial fibrillation during the study. We also um, noted that there were a number of patients on this study who had um, an unexplained or unwitnessed death, or you know, what we think was a sudden cardiac death, although it's difficult to say given the circumstances. Um, there is, has been shown to be an association of ibrutinib with ventricular fibrillation as well as atrial fibrillation. Um, when we looked at you know, deaths from all causes, deaths from unexplained causes, and these sudden deaths, we have not seen any suggestion of a statistically significantly higher risk of, of these deaths in the ibrutinib arms compared to the chemotherapy arm, although numerically you can see that there were a few more events in the ibrutinib containing arms. Um, so I want to show you just one more study of BTK inhibitors in the frontline setting, and this is called the Illuminate trial. Um, this study compared clarimbisol plus obinutuzumab, so um, a kind of um, again, more like gentle, not super standard in the United States right now, but a chemotherapy regimen compared with ibrutinib given with obinutuzumab. Obinutuzumab is a, another CD20 monoclonal antibody that's a little bit more potent than rituximab is. Um, when we look at characteristics of patients on this study, um, it's actually a very high risk group of patients. There was um, between 12 and 16 percent of patients with 17 P deletion, about the same amount with a TP53 mutation, and about 60 percent were IGHV unmutated. And we see again here um, that the combination of ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab was significantly better than clarimbisol plus obinutuzumab. And at 30 months, um, that equated to 77 percent of patients treated with the ibrutinib-containing regimen being still in remission. When we look at the forest plot, looking at some of the different patient characteristics, we see that basically all patients will benefit from an ibrutinib-containing regimen compared to chemotherapy, um, with potentially the, the one um, outlier being those patients who don't have high-risk disease. Grade three adverse events were what we've seen on these other studies where um, the hematologic toxicity, since this is a more gentle regimen, were a, a little bit more similarly matched, but higher in the, on the um, chemotherapy-containing arm. Atrial fibrillation was higher in the ibrutinib-containing arm. So what did we learn from all these data here? So we see that ibrutinib is more effective than chemoimmunotherapy or chemotherapy in the treatment of CLL. Um, ibrutinib probably is more toxic in older patients than in younger. Um, we also see that the addition of rituximab to ibrutinib does not improve progression-free survival. Um, the benefit of obinutuzumab plus ibrutinib is not as clear since that's never been directly compared. Um, so next I want to show you um, a study of a different uh, mechanism in CLL. This is a CLL-14 study, which um, again took previously untreated patients. Generally, these were older patients and randomized them to chemotherapy with clarimisole plus obinutuzumab or a drug called venetoclax, which is an, an inhibitor of BCL2, which, um, as you may recall, is an anti-apoptotic protein, um, which is also very effective in CLL. So um, patients that were on the venetoclax arm also received obinutuzumab, that CD20 monoclonal antibody. And on this study, the patients received obinutuzumab for a total of six months, and venetoclax was given for one year and then therapy was discontinued. So unlike the BTK inhibitor trials where the BTK inhibitor is continued indefinitely, in this study, both groups of patients stopped treatment after a year. And this is the characteristics of patients enrolled on this study. Um, again, it was an older patient population, median age of 72. Um, about 8% of patients had 17P deletion, 10% TP53 mutation, 
and about 60% were IGHV unmutated. With 36 months of follow-up, we can see that progression-free survival is superior for venetoclax plus obinutizumab compared with clamisole plus obinutizumab, um, with PFS at 36 months of 82% for the venetoclax group. When we look again at that IGHB mutational status and really break those patients down, um, one thing I think comes out is that patients who are IGHB mutated, so again, those would be the lower risk patients, do, do better than those patients who are IGHB unmutated um, when given venetoclax plus of venetuzumab. Adverse events, um, venetoclax is probably a little bit more similar to chemotherapy than the BTK inhibitors. Um, so we see hematologic toxicities actually were very similar between those two groups. Um, venetoclax though, does not have the cardiac events that are seen with, um, with ibrutinib. So we didn't see excess hypertension. We didn't see excess atrial fibrillation. Um, we did see diarrhea being a little bit more common in the venetoclax arm. Um, and as well, at this time, there was a kind of trend towards neoplasm, secondary cancer is being more common with venetoclax. So what does this tell us? So it tells us that targeted therapy, again, is more effective than chemotherapy. Um, toxicity between these regimens is not much different. And at three years, the progression-free survival for venetoclax is similar to what is reported for ibrutinib, but obviously different studies, so it's hard to make that comparison. Um, we say, see a separation between IGHV mutated and unmutated. And I think long-term results are going to be very critical to determine the place for this regimen in clinical practice. So now I've told you what are the options right now, but where are we going to go in the future? So these are what I think are the biggest ongoing questions in frontline CLL. Um, certainly, if you talk to a number of different people, people will have different answers for these. Um, but these are the things that I think our current trials and the next generation of trials are really poised to answer. So one is, is venetoclax or venetuzumab or BTK inhibitor-based therapy better? Uh, next is, are there patients who should still be treated with chemotherapy rather than a targeted therapy? Um, third is, could we improve on the efficacy and safety of ibrutinib by using time-limited therapy and potentially giving ibrutinib in combination? Could we improve on the safety of ibrutinib by using a different BTK inhibitor? And finally, is there a role for early therapy in CLL? So we'll go through the, these one by one. So first question, is venetoclax or BTK inhibitor-based therapy better? Um, the you know short answer is we don't really know. Um, I mentioned that the with the follow up that we have on multiple different trials, it does seem like the efficacy is relatively similar, especially at this short period of time. Um, again, we have BTK inhibitors that are continuous therapy compared with venetoclax, which is an indefinite treatment, or I'm sorry, which is a defined time period. So I think long-term follow-up is going to be really crucial to figure out which one of those is actually better in the long term. Um, cost differences, so these are all very expensive drugs. Um, likely, the cost comparison would favor venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, just given the shorter time period of administration. Um, safety differences, again, in the short term, probably favors venetoclax, um, but long-term safety is really unknown. Um, one thing I, I didn't have a chance to show here is um, in a study that, that we did at Ohio State, which I'll show you some of the clinical data in a minute, we looked at what happens to immune cells when patients are treated with combinations, because we know that ibrutinib actually has many positive effects on immune cells. Venetoclax really annihilates most T cells and NK cells, which may have some implications um, in the long term, though we don't really know what those are at this point. So my approach is I assume that there is relatively equivalent efficacy, um, and then we talk to the patients based upon their preference for a therapy duration. Do they care about indefinite treatment? Would they prefer a more defined time period? Um, venetoclax plus venetuzumab requires a lot more visits, um, especially initially. It requires an infusion, so those things are sometimes patients have a preference um, based upon those. And then tolerance of an unclear long-term risk. So we've been pa treating patients with ibrutinib for a decade now, um, if you count the relapse studies, whereas venetoclax, we don't know as much about the long-term um, side effects. So for patients with higher risk disease, I usually prioritize BTK inhibitors. Um, but again, th these may change with long-term data. So next question is, are there patients who should be treated with chemotherapy, and what's the best way to do this? 
Um, so with that chemotherapy regimen that I told you was, was the previous standard of care for younger patients, um, one very important thing that has come out of long-term follow-up of that chemotherapy regimen is that th there are a subset of patients who are likely cured by this chemotherapy regimen. Um, this is two different studies. One is from the MD Anderson group, um, which were the first to use FCR and so have a, a very long follow-up. You can see this instead of being months down here is actually in years. And then um, this is from the German CLL-8 study, which established FCR as a standard of care. And you can see in both of these that for these patients who are IGHB mutated, there is a plateau. Um, in the MD Anderson group, they were able to actually look at patients who achieved minimal residual disease negativity at the end of treatment, meaning we can't find any CLL cells anywhere. And in that group of patients, MRD negative, IGHB mutated, about 80% of patients actually were progression-free 15 years out, so likely are cured. Um, assuming you're not going to know who's going to become MRD positive or negative when you start therapy, that equates to about 60% of patients that are IGHB mutated that have a potential for cure. So that sounds great initially. Um, however, there are unfortunately some long-term complications of FCR, the biggest of which um, is therapy-related myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia, which is relatively uncommon. If you look at different studies, you'll see different numbers, but somewhere between 3 and 5%. Um, so relatively uncommon, however, almost uniformly fatal. So, um, you know, for some people, they're willing to take that risk, a small risk, um, for that larger chance of cure. Other people, um, of course, would have less tolerance of that risk. Um, when the MD Anderson group actually looked at cumulative incidence of death for their patients who were treated with FCR, uh, you can see this is um, patients who were IGHV unmutated still dying of CLL, unfortunately. And basically, um, you know, all of the other causes of death for other patients were pretty similar. Um, so people who were IGHB mutated, dying of things other than CLL, um, and people who were IGHB mutated or unmutated also dying of those complications. So to answer this question, um, you know, like I mentioned, there are some young fit patients who have IGHB mutated disease without high risk genomic abnormalities that have a high chance of cure. Um, we know that patients who become MRD negative, even in the short term, are much more likely to be cured than those who do not. Um, one way that people are investigating, kind of reconciling this benefit of chemotherapy with trying to mitigate the long-term risk is actually to do shorter courses of the chemotherapy and even add something to it. So um, there are studies giving FCR plus with um, either three or six cycles plus fibrinib afterward or FC, and then substituting obinutizumab for rituximab, giving a shorter, and then giving a plus obinutizumab. So far, these have shown really excellent results, but all are single, centers, uh, single arm studies. So next question is, could we improve upon the efficacy and safety of ibrutinib by doing time-limited combination therapy? And I want to um, point out a study that uh, we performed at Ohio State. Um, this has been presented a couple times at our um, big annual meetings and hopefully will be published relatively soon. Um, and this is a combination of ibrutinib with obinutuzumab, the CD20 antibody, with venetoclax. Um, the way that the study is run is we run in obinutuzumab first, so patients get weekly doses of the antibody for the first cycle or for the first month. Then we start ibrutinib for a month, then we start venetoclax. Um, in the middle of therapy, which is after cycle eight, everybody gets a response evaluation, which includes a bone marrow biopsy and CAT scans. Therapy is continued for 14 cycles, so that's about one year, and then is, um, is stopped. And then patients have a response evaluation at that time, too. Um, so this is the characteristics of the patients that we enrolled in this cohort. We've since enrolled another 25 patients to the treatment naive cohort. So we treated at least about 50 patients um, with this regimen in the frontline setting. Um, between this and a phase one portion, about 30 patients in the relapse setting. Um, we have primarily a young patient population. So in, for kind of highlight the treatment naive group there, the median age is 59. Um, 
Uh, let's see, 71% of patients were IGHV unmutated, 32% had that complex karyotype, 12% had deletion 17P. We have a medium follow-up um, uh, when this was first presented of 24 months, so a year on therapy and a year off therapy. We now have follow-up um, with two years median off therapy. And even with that long-term follow-up, only one person has died, and that was a patient in their treatment naive arm who developed an infection, and only one patient has developed progressive disease, and that was in the relapsed refractory arm. Um, side effects were generally what we see with the individual single agents. Um, we do see, a, I think, a little bit higher risk of neutropenia than we would see with any of the agents given by themselves or even kind of additive among those. And we also saw a very high rate of hypertension. So in the treatment naive group, we saw um, an 80% risk of hypertension. Responses, though, were, were excellent. Um, so it Mid-therapy, we had um, eight, of the, eight of the patients had a complete response, 16 partial response, um, and that was about the same at the end of therapy. And about 67% of patients, so two-thirds of patients, were minimal residual disease negative in both the blood and the bone marrow. Um, when you put those all together, it equates to a minimal residual disease negative complete response rate of about 30% in each group. Um, and again, probably more importantly than the, that response rate is the fact that only one person is relapsed with two years off therapy. Um, so there, there's actually a number of studies that are um, kind of variations on that same theme of BTK inhibitor plus BCL2 inhibitor. Um, the reason why I highlight that one, besides the fact that I'm from Ohio State, is because that served as the basis for two ongoing randomized phase three trials. These are the successor studies to the ones I just showed you. Um, and these are, again, taking patients break, broken down by age and looking to see whether it's better to do BTK inhibitors, so kind of that um, indefinite therapy paradigm, or if we can add venetoclax and get people off treatment. So the way that we're doing this in the Alliance study, we're taking patients age 70 and older, um, stratifying them based upon 17P deletion, and then randomizing to ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab or ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab plus venetoclax. Um, so this is the study schema. So anybody who is enrolled to the double at arm, so ibrutinib plus obinutuzumab will have obinutuzumab for six cycles and then continue ibrutinib indefinitely. Those in the triplet arm, um, anybody who has an MRD negative, so mineral residual disease negative complete response, stops all treatment. Those that do not at, at a year's time will continue ibrutinib indefinitely and stop the other drugs. So the primary objective of this study is to compare the doublet to the triplet using that response adaptive discontinuation. Um, the study that's being run for patients under the age of 70 actually uses the same drugs and the same arm. However, in this study, the patients who are enrolled to the triplet arm, so ibrutinib, obinutuzumab, venetoclax, will all stop therapy in about 18 months. Um, so one question that people have brought up is, is the obinutuzumab helping in this case? Or could we just give the ibrutinib plus the venetoclax? Um, these are data from the MD Anderson group who um, did a, a study of ibrutinib plus venetoclax without the obinutuzumab. Um, the follow-up is quite a bit less than what I showed you. So most patients were still on therapy, but you can see that progression-free survival is almost 100% um, at their follow-up time, um, which was about one year off therapy. We see that the rate of MRD negativity is pretty similar with or without the obinutuzumab. So I think it's going to take more long-term follow-up of all these studies to see whether we get a benefit from adding that antibody in the beginning. Um, so next question is, could we improve upon the safety of ibrutinib by using a different BTK inhibitor? Um, and here I want to show you um, some data from a, a newer drug, a second-generation BTK inhibitor called acalabrutinib. And acalabrutinib was designed to be more selective for BTK than ibrutinib is. And the reason for that is because we think that many of the side effects that are um, associated with ibrutinib, things like the hypertension, the arrhythmias, the bleeding, may be from um, the fact that ibrutinib hits a lot of kind of similar or inhibits a lot of proteins that are similar in structure to BTK, um, whereas a calibrutinib does not. And you can see that um, on this kinome screen, scan here, um, where 
each one of these kind of the, the, the brown dots there are different kinases. The red dots show what kinases are inhibited and larger dots show stronger inhibition. So even at a really high concentration of one micromolar, um, you can see clearly that calibrutinib hits less targets than ibrutinib does, um, whereas both of them do hit BTK very strongly. <laughs> so um, the study that they have that has the longest follow-up is a phase 1b2 study in treatment naive disease. Um, and in this study, 99 patients were enrolled. Um, they were initially treated with either twice a day or once a day dosing. Um, after a while, everybody was switched to twice a day dosing after showing that that was um, better in terms of inhibit inhibition of BTK. Um, these are the characteristics of the patients, um, median age of 64, 62% IGHB unmutated, 10% 17P deletion, 20% complex karyotype. So with a median time on study of 42 months, 89% of the patients remained on study treatment and in remission. And very few patients come off for progressive disease, very few come off for adverse events. Um, these are the adverse events that were seen most commonly. And one thing you'll see, so the things that are most common, diarrhea, headache, upper respiratory infection, bruising, arthralgias, those are a lot of the same side effects that we see with ibrutinib. Um, they probably are lower in grade with a calibrutinib. And I think most people that have treated patients with both of these agents will say that a calibrutinib is quite a bit better tolerated than ibrutinib is. Um, when they looked at the adverse events of special interest, so the ones that are more related to ibrutinib, um, atrial fibrillation was seen in 6% of patients, so lower than what we tend to see on the ibrutinib clinical trials. Um, bruising was common, significant bleeding was not. Hypertension was seen in 17% of patients overall, with 7% having grade 3 or higher, um, which is lower than what has been reported with the ibrutinib studies, um, but again, a, a not that many patients, not that long follow-up. Um, infections were seen at 83%, which is pretty standard. Um, this is the schematic of the Elevate TN study, which is the study that led to the FDA approval of a calibrinum in the frontline setting. Um, this was just presented um, for the first time at our annual meeting in December of last year and just recently published. So this trial randomized patients who were either age 65 or older or less than 65 but had a lot of comorbidities, um, randomized one to one to one to clenbrisil plus obinutuzumab, a calibrinum given alone, or a calibrinum burden of given with obinutuzumab. Um, these are the progression for survival curves at a median follow-up of 28 months. Um, so at 24 months, so after one year, 93%, I'm sorry, after two years, 93% of patients treated with a calibrutinib plus obinutuzumab remained progression-free, compared to 87% of patients treated with calibrutinib alone, and 47% of patients treated with cell plus obinutuzumab. This leads to a hazard ratio of 0.1 for the calibrutinib plus obinutuzumab versus the chemotherapy, and 0.2 for calibrutinib alone. There also is, at this time, a, a slight PFS advantage for a calibrutinib plus obinutuzumab given, um, uh, given in contrast to a calibrutinib given by itself. Um, I think many people are waiting until we have a little bit longer follow-up to decide whether to give everybody the combination or the single agent. One reason being is that it's just a lot um, easier for the patients to not come in for the infusions. There's a little bit less toxicity when you don't have the infusions. And I think it's hard to see that there really is that much of a benefit to the doublet regimen. So last question is um, whether there's a role for early therapy in CLL. So CLL has been typified by a watch and wait approach where um, therapy is started at the onset of symptoms or the signs of bone marrow failure. And then it's based upon some older studies where, um, you know, before we knew anything about prognosis, we took kind of all comers and we didn't have a lot of good therapy. So patients um, were either randomized to receive clarambucil by itself or observation. And consistently what was seen is that there was no um, improvement in overall survival um, or even progression-free survival when treatment was given with clarambucil versus nothing. Um, this 
was repeated again in the era of chemoimmunotherapy because the thought was, you know, maybe we're just picking the wrong people to treat. So there are many people who are diagnosed with CLL and never require treatment over the course of their life. So obviously you can't improve upon their survival by treating them with something if they're never going to die of their CLL anyway. Um, and as well, chlorimicil, like I mentioned, is not that great of a drug. So uh, groups in Germany and in France put together this trial a few years ago um, where they took patients um, and then stratified them by risk. So they had a, a risk score um, that was determined by their cytogenetics, IGBH mutational status, thymidine kinase, which is a marker of cell proliferation, and then lymphocyte doubling time, so another marker of kind of a cell proliferation, basically. And patients who are considered low risk were observed. Those that were high risk were randomized to either a wash and wait approach or six cycles of fluvirmine cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Um, so what you can see is that there is a difference in event-free survival. So, I mean, that makes sense. So if you give somebody treatment versus no treatment, you're gonna have a shorter time to pro progression if you don't do treatment. Um, so there was that advantage for FCR over washing the weight, but there was no difference in overall survival between those two approaches, um, which leads to that not being the standard of care currently. Importantly though, probably what I, I think is the most important takeaway from this study is that we're very good at figuring out who is low risk versus who is high risk. Because you can see that the patients who were low risk with a watch and wait approach did much better even than the high risk patients who were treated, um, suggesting that it's really important for us to be performing these prognostic studies prior to starting therapy. Um, so, you know, that was with chemotherapy. The German group again decided to have another. Um, stab at this question now that ibrutinib has come into more widespread use and said, well, maybe the reason that we didn't see a difference with FCR is because FCR is more toxic and maybe people were dying of other things related to the treatment and so we couldn't see a survival advantage. Um, so the study was basically repeated, like the kind of the same setup. So low risk patients were, wa were weighted, were watched and observed. Um, those that were considered high risk were randomized in this study to either ibrutinib or placebo. Um, interestingly, adverse events were the same for ibrutinib and placebo, which I think is much more a commentary on how poor we are at figuring out adverse events and whether they're related to drug um, than what is actually going on with the drugs. Because certainly we know that if you give people a sugar pill and give them ibrutinib, they should have more side effects with the drug. Um, Event-free survival was much superior for ibrutinib compared to placebo. So again, if you treat somebody, their time to progression is gonna be shorter than if you don't treat them. Um, at this time, there is no difference in overall survival, although the study really needs to mature a few more years before I think um, we can say for sure whether um, that early treatment was helping people. Um, so at Ohio State, we completed our own early intervention trial, and we um, used two, two arms but didn't have a placebo arm. So we took patients that were considered to be high risk and gave everybody two years of ibrutinib. Um, but we did this either concurrently or after vaccination against influenza and pneumonia. So the purpose of our study was actually to see whether giving a drug like ibrutinib would make vaccines more effective. Um, so this is our progression-free survival curve from the time that they stopped treatment. So after two years of ibrutinib therapy, you can see that there are some patients who progress relatively quickly. Um, at six months afterward, 89% of patients I'm sorry, 80% of patients were progression-free. Um, so I think it remains to be seen whether this will benefit some of these patients in terms of overall progression-free survival. We, here's, we're looking at vaccine efficacy. Um, arm A here is our um, concurrent treatment. So vaccines were given along with the ibrutinib. Arm B is sequential arm, so patients were given vaccinations against um, pneumonia with Prevnar 13 and vaccinations against the flu, and then um, then we then we started ibrutinib afterward. And you can see that we do see responses, um, like humoral responses to vaccinations with both the Prevnar 13 and influenza B. Actually, um, we see. Um, more marked response to the pneumonia vaccine in the patients that were given ibrutinib plus the vaccines. Um, 
However, surprisingly, we see a bigger difference in influenza A in the patients that were given the vaccine sequentially. The other thing, which is I think probably the most important takeaway of this study is that with the Prevnar 13 vaccine, which we tend to think of as being good for most patients for five years or so, um, at 12 months, the, the um, vaccine titers had worn off. So basically patients were only getting benefit with, within like six and nine months after the time they were vaccinated. Um, and I tell you this to lead into a planned early intervention study, which is um, going to be run by the SWOG Cooperative Group. And this study is actually going to take newly diagnosed CLL patients um, who are considered high risk, and they're going to be randomized to early therapy versus delayed therapy. So um, it's going to be in a two-to-one fashion um, where uh, Patients will either receive venetoclax plus abinutuzumab at that time or wait until progression and then receive venetoclax plus abinutuzumab. So this study is expected to start really within the next few months. Um, so it, it's going to take a long time for the study to read out, but hopefully it's um, something that people will want to participate in and we can really, I think, answer this question once and for all. So um, where are we going in CLL? So I think long-term follow-up of the ECOG study of FCR versus ibrutinib and rituximab and some of these studies of abbreviated chemotherapy with ibrutinib are really going to be important to tell us how best to manage those young fit patients who are IGHV mutated to give them the best chance of cure without a high risk of developing other diseases from their treatment. Combinations of targeted therapies appear very promising, and I think the new intergroup studies, the cooperative group studies that are ongoing will help us determine whether um, these combinations are better than ibrutinib alone. Acalabrutinib is likely more tolerable and probably as effective than ibrutinib. Um, there actually is a head-to-head -head trial of those two drugs, ibrutinib versus acalabrutinib, in high-risk relapsed patients um, that has been completed for a little over two years now. Um, it hasn't read out, which I think probably means that th there's not much difference between those two. And I think the jury is still out over whether high-risk patients will benefit from early targeted therapy. And hopefully um, the CLL12 study, the ibrutinib versus placebo, and then this newly starting study will help us answer that question. So to conclude, um, ibrutinib and now venetoclax and acalabrutinib have really changed the paradigm of CLL therapy. Um, most patients with CLL will never receive chemotherapy for their disease. Um, although our current therapies are effective, I think there are definitely areas of questions and areas in needs of improvement. Um, and prospective clinical trials remain extremely important to help determine the best frontline treatment for our patients with CLL. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everybody who provided data for this presentation. I'd like to thank our team at Ohio State, our funding sources, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Dr. Wyatt, thank you very much for this very uh interesting and optimistic view of uh, CLL, and it's uh, comforting to know that it's treatable and it's even going to be more treatable as we move forward. I wonder to begin with if we could, um, if you could tell me anything about your experience with your CLL patients and the COVID-19 uh, exposure. Do they, one would imagine that they fare worse, but do they in fact, is that true or better or, or what has been your observation? Yeah, so, you know, I've, um, me and my colleagues have actually spoken to people in lots of other parts of the country, because luckily we don't have a lot of COVID in Ohio, um, and as well as some people around the world, places like Italy and Spain. And, you know, I, I don't think it's clear yet how much of a higher risk our CLL patients have than patients without CLL. I mean, one would expect that it's going to be higher, and I think that's probably the case, but um, it's just not, not been shown definitively yet. One thing that is really interesting, though, is that patients with um, patients who are on ibrutinib may actually have a lower, sorry, on the screen here, um, lower risk of having bad disease than patients not on ibrutinib. Um, so, there is some data 
from the laboratory, uh, which would suggest that BTK inhibitors might be very be ben beneficial for patients who get COVID-19 um, because it decreases cytokine production and also changes um, the skewing of T cells away from kind of that exhausted phenotype or ones that can, uh, that are maybe contributing to the lung damage and towards a, a, a phenotype that allows more viral clearance, um, including actually a, a study that was done in a mouse model where mice were given a lethal dose of influenza and then treated with ibrutinib or placebo. And interestingly, the ibrutinib treated mice didn't die, so they were able to clear the virus, and none of them developed severe lung injury, which was seen in most of the mice in the control arm. So um, obviously that is mouse data. We don't know how that is gonna be applicable to patients, um, but there was also a very small study that was just observational in nature um, that came out in blood a few weeks or maybe a month ago now from the group at Dana-Farber who treat patients with Waldenstrom's. And they were kind of um, sharing their experience with six patients with Waldenstrom's who were on ibrutinib that got COVID-19. And so five of them had actually a very benign course. Um, the sixth one actually was on low-dose ibrutinib, so they had um, been de-escalated in dose for toxicity at one point. Um, came in the hospital, was hypoxic, and they were given tocilizumab and also increased the dose of ibrutinib, and then that patient actually cleared the virus and got better relatively quickly. So there's a number of studies actually ongoing right now um, for starting, just starting to see whether BDK inhibitors might actually be beneficial in COVID-19. Thank you very Thank you. much. We have time for one question. Uh, Jose, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hi. Uh, so, so there's data now showing that there's synergy between ibrutinib and checkpoint inhibitors. And my question is, how does that apply to the treatment of CLL? Uh, also, uh, the, uh, this immune effect is mostly due to ITK inhibition rather than BTK, and the calibrutinib does not have that feature. How do you think that will impact this potentially beneficial immune effects mm -hmm. of uh, ibrutinib? Yes, yeah, so those are two great questions. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there there does seem to be synergy with BTK inhibitors, or at least ibrutinib and checkpoint inhibitors. Checkpoint inhibitors, unfortunately, like just don't seem to work in CLL, probably just because of the um, significant immune suppression in the disease. Um, there have been some small studies with ibrutinib in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor or a checkpoint inhibitor themselves in Richter's transformation, so where CLL transforms to a more aggressive lymphoma, um, and showing that that at least the combination is probably beneficial. Um, it's unclear whether the checkpoint inhibitor by itself is beneficial. Um, it doesn't seem like there's much role for the combination in regular, just non-transformed CLL, but I think that in the transformed disease, it does look promising. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, many of the immune effects, at least on T cells, are due to ibrutinib's inhibition of ITK. And that is probably responsible for the skewing from the um, from a Th2 to a Th1 phenotype. In vitro, we don't see a lot of um, a, like that same change with a calibrutinib. Interestingly, though, um, one of my colleagues at Ohio State, Mei Zhao Long, um, did a study where he took patient samples from our trials of ibrutinib and a calibrutinib, and many of the changes that we see, like so the decreases in cytokine production, um, the, like some of the kind of more activation that we can see in T cells was actually seen with both ibrutinib and a calibrutinib. Um, what we didn't see is the skewing from TH2 to TH1. And there was some, um, some other changes in terms of like stem memory T cells that were not seen with a calibrutinib than ibrutinib. Um, you know, when a calibrutinib was starting to go into clinical trials, there was some question, like, would we see differential efficacy because of that? Um, I don't think that that is likely bearing out, or at least like not with this follow-up. Thank you very much. I want to thank you again for great grand rounds and thank everyone for participating. A uh, safe trip back to Ohio in <laughs> cyberspace, and um, we'll uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. For our residents, we're just going to put up the uh, Grand Rounds sign-in sheet uh, QR code now.